basic education track and field team of the same school. Okay, so now I'll start the presentation. Okay. One moment. Awesome. So I'll we'll just go through some um, mm -hmm. new stuff. Okay, we're starting now. Awesome. So, okay. um, yeah, so the first thing is we have now, uh, is this the first slide? Or this yes, is the this second a, slide? The second okay. slide, yes. Yeah, so we just skipped the first one because we've already talked to Mary Joy. And, um, okay, so this is my update on athletic track ovals in the Philippines in 2020. Um, so I basically did this in cooperation with, uh, not th this, these charts are by Noni Lopez, the Visayas director. So he, uh, for the PSC. So these are basically all where all the track ovals are in the Philippines. There's 78 of them. So, you know, like the, the problem is not so much the number of track ovals because pretty much every region has at least one. It's basically the accessibility of these track ovals to the public. Um, but, you know, having this guide, which is down the bottom, pinoyathletic.info athletic, uh, backslash athletic slash track, um, it basically shows everybody where the track ovals are because, you know, some people are in regions or provinces, they've got no idea where the nearest track oval is. So this guide that I've provided and it's been updated over the last nine years basically shows you where all the track ovals are. It basically has a breakdown of where the national track and field athletes are from, which which regions they come from, which provinces they come from, which is at the end of the article. And also it basically has pictures of all, where, of all the track ovals. Um, and this is just constantly updated. So this is one of our unique resources on Pinoy Athletics, which uh, is not found anywhere else at this time. It's a um, comprehensive guide of track ovals. Okay, uh, next slide or not? Yeah, one more. Okay, okay, so, yeah, but how many of these tracks are actually used? So, you know, like a lot of track ovals in the Philippines are, as Dr. Mekki says, white elephants. They're not, you know, a lot of them are basically not being maintained, not being used rubber like for example the track oval at uh Kage and de Oro, their main track oval it doesn't have any rubber on it anymore the rubber's worn off there's been talks of putting rubber back on it but until now no rubber's been put back on that track um the the tr track oval at dapitan and zambuanga um del norte um you know that's just got cracked rubber everywhere that was where they had a puller on bump so that's no longer really usable um, some of the track ovals, like the one at Amaranto, that's that's like basically only half there now, and you know it's not a standard sized oval. So, you know, there's a lot of ovals that are in need of repair. Um, actually, uh, buddy, I think the reason why in Amaranto is standard so because actually it's a velodrome, so it's used for speed cycling. So yeah, it was, if you. Yeah. If you're going to see Amaranto, it's makes use as a stadium and. Um, the center is, I think yeah. it's a very home. It was listed in the um, PSC's um, list of track ovals, though. That's why I felt I would mention it, because there are some track ovals that are included in the list of a substandard. But, of course, even with some s substandard ovals, you can have a element of some events at substandard ovals. But, of course, mm -hmm. you can't have the full set of track and field events at a substandard oval mm -hmm. to be ratified. But you can still have some events like some track ovals have field facilities and not sufficient track size so you can still have uh some events which can be ratified at certain track ovals and not others yes yes okay um also we must um we must also th um uh, imply that of course having the good track over of our region should be the maintenance is the key. The reason why most of the sports complexes in uh, in other sides of the Philippines, even that they built it for the longest time, are they have a well kept maintenance. For example, the Mindanao Civic Center in Tubodlano del Norte, it has been like for almost twenty years, and I must say that their track oval is on a good condition. Although of course the there's okay. some paint um, marks, but of course 
feel, it is not yeah. as light as in Cagayan de Oro where the rubber surface has already been peeled yeah. off. So I think it's what also... you need to consider as well when it comes to a track oval, and a good example is what they do in Australia with, with maintenance of track ovals, depending on the quality of the rubber that's put on the track, you know, it, and it also depends how the rubber is um, looked after. For example, if people are riding bicycles on the track, that will destroy the, cr the track really quickly. If there's a high number of people using the track, you know, like if there's joggers on the track every day, hundreds and hundreds of people just stamping on the track every day, that will wear out the track quicker. In Australia, what they do is they open the track ovals for a few hours during the day, and the rest of the time the track ovals are closed and people have to just go and train on a grass track oval during those times. That's how they prolong the life of a track oval in Australia, is they only allow access during certain times of the day to use the track oval. And, you know, absolutely no bikes, you know, or anything, you know, bikes or people wearing soccer studs, you know, or rugby boots or anything like that are allowed on the track. That's an automatic ban. You can't, people who, you know, like do things that will wreck the track, like ride bikes or whatever on the track, they get banned. That's an automatic ban. You can't, you won't be allowed to set foot on the track again if you do that. That's why, you know, there's like some areas are better at policing that than others with, when, with the terms of treating the track over with respect. And, um, you know, so it doesn't wear out as quickly. Yes, exactly. And I must say that there's another track oval that is, I think, still being built. Okay. Um, actually, based on ARE Adventures, a travel agency, it's also gone. The, they're building Balogo Sports Complex in Solsogon City. And Solsogon is a coliseum type of structure. And they're aiming to host the 2023 Palarong Pambansa. Um, well, so that, that's on the guide, Ernel, there's actually about 20 track ovals which are undergoing um, production at the moment throughout the Philippines. I mean, there's 15 to 20 track ovals being built as, of, as, as, as we speak. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And the guy that has yeah, included Source are gone. There's also one being built off the top of my head. There's another one being built mm -hmm. in Occidental Mindoro. There's, um, mm -hmm. of course, um, there's a track oval being built at Sarangani, I think. Um, yeah, in Sarangani, yes. There's one in Sarangani. There's another track oval being built up in the Abra region. So there's a lot of track, there's a lot of construction going on at the moment um, in various parts of the country. I believe, according to the statistics, all but 34 provinces in the Philippines have a track oval already, mm. a, a rubberized track oval. Okay. Yes. Yes, buddy. Uh, to continue. Yeah. Next slide. Okay, so yeah, this is leftover material from the last um, session on the pole vault. So um, Cornelius Warman Dam, he held the uh, pole vault record for 17 years. Um, one of our readers, uh, one of our viewers on Pano Athletics felt that we should mention him. Um, he vaulted over 15 feet 43 times, the first man to clear 15 feet, which was an achievement at the time because they were using the bamboo poles. Um, he, he had the world record for 17 years. His meet record was finally broken and world record was finally broken in 1957 by Bob Gutowski using a metal pole. He never got, even though he held the world record for 17 years in the pole vault, he never got to compete in the Olympics because the Olympics was held during the war. By the time the war was over, he was past his playing years by 1948 when the Olympics resumed at London after the war. So. Um, we felt we were in the spirit of mentioning pole vault, um, you know, with EJ going to the Olympics and all. I felt that um, we pay tribute to a athlete um, that, you know, like was one of the pioneers when it came to um, the world record progression in the pole vault. And uh, the guy, I think he was po yeah, Polish, Pol no, uh, American, American athlete. Okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. So this is again more stuff on the pole vault, but you know there's only going to be two slides on pole vault. So the evolution of the pole vault, 
We have an article on Pinoy Athletics called Pole Vault Evolution, linked down the bottom. So Pole Vault went from hardwood to bamboo to metal and aluminium to the fiberglass and carbon fibers of today. Okay, next slide. Okay, so yeah, so this is the news I've gotten from the Thailand Athletics Association. They have now started their competitions again. They had their first competition, which was a special triple jump competition. So SEA Games, uh, that was on the 24th yesterday. Um, their SEA Games champion in the triple jump, the 22-year-old Parinya Chumarong. She jumped 14 meters, improving on her season's best of 1368 back in January. Um, just 17 centimeters off her personal best, which was set three years ago. So despite the COVID, you know, Thailand has national athletes have continued training and um, they're jumping, you know, she's jumping close to a PB right now. Um, and then the, on the men's side, Teparak Parachaya, who was a uh, former silver or bronze medalist at one of the last couple of SEA Games. Um, he jumped the season lead in the men's of 15.95. And uh, the link's down the bottom. Um, that will still be on our front page. Um, so we're just, you know, just updating with Southeast Asian Athletics News. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so inducted into the legends of track and field. He was already there, but we made a more comprehensive article, building on the article originally by Hurdler 49, Joe Boy Quintos. Um, Miguel White was the last Filipino to win an Olympic bronze medal in athletics. He won a bronze in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. Um, his mark of 52.8 was the Philippine record for, 32, uh, for 38 years until Abdul Qadir Gopar broke it in the Tehran Asian Games, which uh, Gopar went on to win in um, well, 1973. Yeah, he won the 1973 Asian Championships and then he broke the record at, of, um, at the uh, Asian, Asian Champs. Um, the closest, he's the closest Filipino athlete ever to get to a track and field world record. In 1936, he ran 52.8. In 1927, this was comparable to the world record of 52.6, which was set nine years earlier. So a nine year differential is the closest any athlete has ever gotten to a world record. I believe that, you know, even Del Prado and Lydia de Vega were around 15, 16, 18 years apart from when their performance was the world record, when they set their times. Um, Miguel White, but before he became the 1936 uh, Olympic bronze medalist, he was also the Far East Asian Games champion in the 400 hurdles. So the Far East Asian Games, what they had before later more countries joined and it later became the Asian Games. The Far East Asian Games was mainly a competition between China, Japan and the Philippines. Um, Miguel White was a war hero. Um, he was killed in action fighting the Japanese in the Second World War. And um, details on him and the other legends of track and field can be found on our website with the link below. Uh, next slide. Okay, so next, um, big news in the Diamond League at Stockholm. Um, Karsten Walholm is really in the league of his own right now. The Norwegian uh, hurdler has had the performance on the 23rd of August at the Stockholm Wanda Diamond League um, with 46.87, which is the second fastest hurdles of all time, just 0.05 behind the world record of Kevin Young, set 28 years ago of 46.82. He knocked over, what makes this more surprising is he knocked over that last hurdle, which co could have um, been a world record, but he'll probably pick up, um, he will, may even pick up the world record in his next race because he just gets better every time he runs. He's the only man who's ever broken 47 seconds twice with 46.87 and 46.92. So not even... The world record holder Kevin Young was able to run two sub 47 second uh, 400 hurdles. 
He is undefeated this season after he won the Diamond League in Monaco in 47-10. His performance was an area record, a world lead, a Diamond League record, and a meet record. The previous record at the Stockholm Diamond League was by Abdurrahman Samba, set two years ago, 47-41. Um, while Holm continues to win his hurdles races by uh, margins of two seconds or more, um, quite surprisingly, like within an hour, he came back and he won the 400 metres as well in 45.05, um, very close to his PB of 44.87 set three years ago, but obviously not on as fresh pair of legs as he just run a, um, you know, like the second fastest time ever in the 400 hurdles. Uh, long link below. Again, this will be on our front page. Uh, moving to the next slide. We have um, some more updates. Uh, we have a video first of him running. I, I'm not sure if this will play. We'll just see how it goes. Um, I think it's not playing. Okay, we'll just skip past the video. They can just view that on YouTube. Oh, okay, so that was just going to be a video of while I'm running 4687, but obviously it might show up quite a bit of bandwidth. Okay, so other notable performances in Stockholm. So after jumping um, like 560 at his national championships, Duplantis, the world record holder in the men's pole vault, moved one centimetre better than he'd done this year to a 601 metre world lead. Um, also impressive at the Diamond League was the uh, world junior record holder, Yulia Mahuchik uh, of Ukraine, who's still who was born in 2001, so still just 18 years of age. She got a world lead of two metres in the women's high jump. Um, also impressive was Angela Del Ponte of Switzerland, who had her seventh win in a row in 11.20, beating a uh, uh, world bronze medalist, um, Talu of the Ivory Coast, again. Um, without Noah Lyles at the meet, Adam Gamili of Great Britain went on to win a windy 220.61. However, um, that wind, you know, looking at that race, the wind was pretty much blowing in their face for the first half of the race. They didn't really benefit until like they were quite down the home straight from that. So it was a, you know, like it was a tailwind, but would have been tough at the start, the way the wind was actually curling around. Um, and then the Italian uh, Boggioliolo of Italy won the 100 hurdles in a sub-13 time of 12.88 in the women's 100 hurdles. So all those results and more are up on the Premier Athletics website. Uh, we'll move to the next slide. Okay, so, yeah, so I had mistakenly thought that this was held yesterday after having talks with uh, with uh, Bon Alves of Malaya, but no, it's actually tonight um, at midnight. So it's, you know, I don't know, 12 p.m. Um, it should be 6 p.m., 6 p.m. local time also uh, here. 6 p.m., yeah. So it'll be 12 midnight in the Philippines. Yes, 12 in time because for summer we have six our delay difference It'll from be the 12 Philippines. midnight in the Philippines and two o'clock in the morning in Australia. Um, but I probably I might stay up and well, actually, I probably won't because I've got work tomorrow. But like what I'm saying is, you know, like, um, it's going to be a good competition to watch because according to the stats, you know, there's about 20 world class vaulters there, including Duplantis, who I mentioned before, he'll be competing there. Sam Kendricks will be there. I think Thiago Braz will be there. So EJ will have like a lot of very good competition. It'll be like a dress rehearsal for the Olympics almost because pretty much almost everyone's going to be there. Um, so if we can find a live stream, I'll be putting it up on the uh, on the website. I'm not sure if I'll be how much updates I can do because I you know I've got to get up and go to work tomorrow. So I like, I probably won't be staying up to watch it. Um, but we'll you know we'll see. Probably when I get up, I'll post something. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so like the news as well is allegedly the world's fastest man who said Bolt has tested positive for the COVID, you know, after holding some parties and stuff, he's tested positive for COVID, so I think he has to be quarantined. Um, next slide. 
Okay, so I've been providing UAP data on the men's uh, two and 400. Like all this data is up on the Puma Athletics website. Basically what we've done is we've taken the results of the last five UAAPs for each athlete in each event, and we've averaged out the level of improvement or decline for each athlete or each event. Um, so the data clearly shows that Adamson, with three athletes who have improved significantly um, in the subset of data, um, has had the biggest improvement rate in the men's 200 at the UAAP over the last five years, but more, probably more likely over the last two or three years, um, as there was steady and then rapid improvement the last couple of years. Uh, next slide. So the men's, the other event, we looked at the men's 400 as well. So the other week I did the men's 100, uh, back one, I think. I think you've jumped a few slides there. Yeah, uh, is there not, is that the next slide? Or is there another one? Okay, um, we'll come back to the men's 400. So I've mixed up my slides a bit. So yeah, this is like a thing I found. It's an infograph on the other week when Joshua Chip, Chip, uh, Chip Tegi broke the world record in the men's 5,000. These are the times he ran. So if you look at the time he's run, he's running evenly on average around 60, 60 seconds, you know, 60 to 60.5. So he's been running very smoothly. That's why when we talk to runners, you know, who are running 3,000 or, or events, it's very important to ask them, very important to ask athletes, you know, if they want to run, if they're aiming to run a certain time. And I've done, you know, it happened a few years ago when it, with a girl, you know, and she said she wanted to get bronze at the Polaro or something like that in the 3,000. And I was like, okay, so what do you need to run? And she's like, oh, I don't know. And I was like, oh, you're running about 10.45. And then she's like, okay, I'll run that then. I was like, okay, but what do you need to run each lap? If you divide 10.45 by seven and a half and spread that out evenly, what's at each lap? I don't know, I'm just gonna run fast. What happens, the Polaro rolls around, she doesn't get, she runs to the front, cannot pace herself well, goes out to the front for the first few, three laps, tries to stick with the leaders who are much better 400 speed type runners, Try runs ahead for the first three, you know, runs ahead for the first three laps of the leaders. Last four laps gets passed by everybody and comes dead last because he hasn't planned out how she's going to distribute her laps, her, her, her times per lap because, you know, there was absolutely no, you know, no planning or strategy involved when it came to that race. Uh, it wasn't one of mine, my athletes, but, you know, like, Basically, I had asked her that question long before the race started. What do you need to run each lap? But you know, she just didn't seem to care about about that. Just wanted to go out and you know, just run at the front and you know, then get you know worn down by everybody in the second half of the race. Okay, next uh, slide. So yeah, this is the data that I was actually got mixed up it should have been around on the other slide but yeah it's just showing that like in the men's 200 the men's 400 adamson has a solid program in place i mean they've had an average of a 1.87 second improvement per athlete um over the last five years um so like that's not 1.87 seconds the, that doesn't mean the athletes are getting 1.87 seconds better each year that means that you know, on they're getting about you divide that by five, and you know there's just a constant sort of improvement each year of that amount. But with Adamson, the real boost has come over the last three years, more to the point when they brought in a new sprint coach. Um, next slide. So all that data is available on the website. I mean, we're covering every event. Yeah. So like now, I'm just going into coaching. I've just signed up to finish my level three athletics course for sprints and hurdles part two, uh, October 24, 31. Um, very good coaching mentor um, has been made available to me. It wasn't cheap. I had to dish out another $300 to get that course done. But you know, um, right now with COVID and all, you know, with having to coach athletes online, this is the opportunity to actually grab and do the do the, uh, you know, finalize myself with the accreditation. Um, I, like I said, I don't think, you know, with the costs and, you know, with my experience, I don't think I'll be doing level four for another, you know, couple of years, hopefully before I turn 40. But, 
you know, I'm not no rush to do level four. I just need to gain some, like, you know, I just need to implement what I've learned from level three to the athletes I work with, and then, then you know, eventually move to level four one day. Okay, next slide. So yeah, this is more about the coaching stuff that I've been doing recently. I've been working online with athletes. I haven't been able to really, um, well, I've been working with some kids here, but like, um, you know, schools, with school programs, but I haven't really like gone to the club or anything like that. Cause I, you know, it's just been difficult because like a lot of them are reluctant because of COVID. Okay, uh, next slide, Ernell. All right, so yeah, those are sprinters in my training group, um, running 250s. I think I might have, and I didn't show this because we ran out of time the other week. So I lowered the target a little bit for the for the guys just to make sure they're running on time. And yeah, they, they didn't achieve their old targets last week, but I adjusted the targets based on what I felt they were capable of and they achieved the targets. Um, yeah, so we're looking at, you know, averages and around the, you know, and Ronald did really well because he didn't actually finish the session last week and now he's finished the session. And they're averaging under 36 at 80%, which is around a 29, 30 second all out 200 effort, uh, which gives them a low 23, mid to high 22 type 200 meter time, which is much better than what they were doing prior. Okay, next. Uh, Next slide. Okay, yeah, so the sprinters, um, again, Ron, he, he, he ran 40 yards. He got time for 40 yards at four hand time, of course, uh, 4.7. So that's around, you know, that's around 11.6. You know, he ran 12.3 the, uh, 12 the other year. And, um, you know, but, you know, it just, with the more like, you know, that's just one run, but like just to be more consistent with timing and the runs, um, he ran several 40 meters timed uh, by two people at 5.7, um, which is equivalent according to the speed calculator at about 12.3 electronic, but that's 12.3 electronic with a sled versus running 12.3 all out last year with, you know, in a race situation. So there is a gain there in terms of the uh, training process um, so next week, my guys are going to be testing. They're going to have a quick. They're going to have a run. The two of them are going to have a run over a 60, a 150, and a 300, which is a eight-week training together. And uh, that will be my testing week to see, um, you know, like how they're going in terms of times, and the, you know, give them a bit of motivation where they can actually have a like a mini sort of trial, not really a comp, but just the two of them having a race with whoever else they can get to join in. Okay, next uh, slide. Yeah, so like with coaching uh, the athletes, I basically came up with this model. One of the drills that the beginner athletes get wrong are the, a lot of the skips for distance. And the skips for distance, as you notice in the correct model, the back leg is extended. Whereas in the incorrect model, the back leg is kicking back up, which creates Weight more time wasted in the air and less force supplied on the ground. So um, that is one common error we have with teaching beginners. With the, there's about three or four sets of drills in the sequence, which are really difficult for beginners to get. But basically, the stick figures have been presented to show, you know, what like what form we're actually looking for with the you know, we're teaching these basic drills. Okay, next uh, slide. All right, so yeah, I had one athlete um, and she presented me with this. I was really happy with this. It shows that she follows the instructions well, does the exact pace required. So it was an easy 5K run. She ran it in 31 minutes. Um, probably could go a little faster, but you know, that, that was fine. Um, she's used technology. So she's used a sports uh, watch or, you know, app on a phone to help her with her training. She stuck to the program. I told her to run 5K easy. She ran 5.04, which is pretty much 5K, extra 40 meters, but that's no biggie. 
um, she doesn't do extra things in the program that are going to get her injured. So, you know, if she didn't go out and run, she went out and ran the 5K at an easy pace in 30 minutes. She didn't go out and run a 5K in, um, well, you know, of course she's not going to run 15 minutes, but, you know, she didn't go out and run a 5K in 20 two minutes or something like that, which, you know, would have been an all-out effort. Because this wasn't an all-out effort. This was a recovery easy run, which she followed the instructions well and presented, you know, like an accurate way of recording it, which I hadn't expected. But, you know, she sort of went that extra mile, which I was very proud of as a coach, that she um, was taking her training very seriously with using whatever resources she had available because I know in the Philippines um, a lot of athletes don't have much they don't have they don't have um, a lot of things that you know athletes training in other countries may have access to but like it's good to see how some athletes are very keen to innovate with what they have available okay next slide And I think this is just more a bit more on this athlete who's a you know a middle slash long distance runner that I'm working with from CDO. Um, yep. So next uh, slide. Yeah. So with the athlete, um, this is just another spreadsheet I did. Um, the athlete ran um, the other week she ran three eight hundreds, so I gave her three one k runs. I'm going to add a bit more variation to the training next week because I don't want it to get too sort of repetitive. Um, she ran three fifty five, four ten, and four twelve. Target was four minutes thirty. She achieved her target, and um, based on her times, um, her output times are three sixteen if she was using eighty percent or three twenty eight if she was using eighty five percent effort on those on the average of those three runs, which sort of is in line with you know her predicted two forty ish times for the two forty ish two thirty two forty ish times for the eight hundred which you know with a PB of two fifty four there will be a bit of a gain you know quite quickly with, with, with that event. Okay, next slide. Okay, so yeah, we're looking at um, possibly, I, I've been asked by Dean Hook if we can do a um, um, session on um, the pitfalls of professionalizing co collegiate sports in the Philippines. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the training bubble type issues that are um, happening at the moment. We, we've talked quite a bit about it and um, um, we mainly focused on athletics. So the, this is more to do with varsity basketball. Um, uh, we will look into this issue a little, little bit more when we have a bit more info from the other group in regards to the other side in regards to this issue. Okay. Uh, I think that's it, or is, there, is that all the slides now, or is, was there any more? Okay, that's it. Okay, so we're all good. Thanks, Ernell, and thanks, yes, Brian. You're welcome. For... Yes, okay. Um, thank you as well. So we end our session this afternoon here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's all. That's all good for today. So we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, maybe me and you, Ernell, we can have a quick chat after this for about five or ten. But um, okay. yeah, everyone else can um, uh, head off, for, and we we are we are appreciative of everybody's time um, for today. Yes, and yes, and we thank as well, uh, Mr. Brian Yadlong of ABC Win Sports for joining us up to this session. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Yes, thank you, thank you. Very, very informative as usual, Enzo. <laughs> yes, and keep in touch to us for any updates related to Philippine athletics. This is Finner Athletics. Um, since 2012, we've been providing with online news and views related to the Philippine athletics community.
So we would be happy if you can, yeah, if we're happy to be guests once in a while in your sessions as well. Just let us know. Okay. So we wrap up our session for this afternoon. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat at mabuhay po tayong lahat. God bless. Mabuhay ang Pilipinas. Mabuhay ang atlet ng Pilipino. Salamat po.